Well, welcome everyone um, to this session, which we're calling Rewriting Human Genes. I'm Joe Palka. Um, a couple of pieces of housekeeping to start with. Uh, please turn the ringer off on your cell phone. Uh, someone suggested to me that if your cell phone goes off during this session, it means you have a burning question, and I'll ask you to come up on stage, stand in the middle, and say it out loud, and then sing your college alma mater. Um, so, but we do want you to leave your phones on because you're welcome to uh, tweet questions up to me. I have a pad here, which I'll be getting them. The hashtag is global health. Um, and anybody who's out there who would like to ask a question, feel free to tweet them at uh, hashtag global health. I have a pad here that will receive them. And um, that's really <coughs> about it. We're going to have a 45 minute discussion about uh, genetics, uh, after which there'll be a quiz. So um, <laughs> please be sure and take notes. No, there's no quiz. This is just an attempt to uh, catch up with some of the most interesting uh, science that's being done in the world right now. And two of the people who are directly or ten indirectly ten directly involved in it are uh, with me on the panel. First, there's uh, Jennifer Doudna from the University of California, uh, Berkeley. Uh, she has been very popular lately for a technology that I'm sure we'll start to talk about called CRISPR. And we'll let Craig Mello <laughs> tell you exactly what that stands for. No, I'm only teasing him. Uh, we also have with us Craig Mello. He's done some interesting things in biology, including working with a, something called RNA interference, which is an interesting way of silencing genes. And uh, uh, some committee in Sweden decided that that was a very interesting um, piece of research and awarded him the Nobel Prize for doing it. So um, they have credibility. <laughs> I'd say you should believe everything they say, but they have credibility. So I thought uh, Craig made the interesting point that rather than launch right into rewriting genes, let's, let's do a little biology 101 and talk about what we're talking about. <laughs> so Craig, what, what do we mean when we talk about rewriting genes? What are genes? Okay, great. Thanks, Joe. It's great to be here and, and welcome everybody. Um, I've, I've had a lot of experience in the last few years um, talking to lay audiences about science. And one of the things that uh, you realize is, is that you know, our vocabularies don't mesh up very well. Uh, people, I, I've given whole lectures and then at the end had people say, well, uh, RNA is protein. <laughs> Someone has a burning question. <laughs> Uh, our, you know, things like that, our RNA and protein, you know, what do those words mean? These are really jargon, jargony terms, if you will. So I'm going to just give you a very quick, brie uh, brief uh, introduction to gene expression. So uh, gene expression is really, really simple. There's an alphabet that has four uh, different letters, just four letters in the entire alphabet. And there are basically 20 different words that can be spelled in a series of, you know, co uh, what, what our three letter words can spell each of these different amino acids, which make up the 20 different building blocks of protein. So you have in every cell your genetic material, your DNA, your genome, which is billions of nucleotides long. The nucleotides are the letters. And wherever there's a, a G nucleotide, it pairs up with a C. Wherever there's an A, it pairs up with a T. So those are your four things, and that's basically the structure that forms into this beautiful spiral uh, double helical structure and explains so much about, for example, how your DNA replicates, because when your DNA unwinds, each strand can encode uh, by, through this very precise mechanism of base pairing, can encode for the other strands. So you always can template a new strand using either of the two strands of your genome. It's really simple stuff. It's really basic. And then when your DNA genes are expressed, it's transcribed into RNA, which is another four-letter uh, type of nucleic acid. It's another form of the genetic code. It gets processed into what we call messenger RNAs. Then those are decoded by reading the sequence of nucleotides in the genetic code three at a time, and each of the three letters of code specify a different amino acid that's then assembled by this amazing machine called the ribosome, 
into proteins by assembling the amino acids that are called out, the 20 different amino acids, which have all these different chemical properties, are then assembled into a linear chain that make your proteins. So gene expression is incredibly simple. Everybody should know this. It's a starting point for this discussion because you know, your genome is made up of this organization of letters that specify all the different types of proteins that your body can make. So that's my sort of bio 101 introduction and we can sort of spring off from there. And now I'm gonna repeat it to make sure that I've got it right. <laughs> <laughs> but also to say one of the things that uh, boggles my mind always is that you can, with from these four letters that combine in various, go in various orders, it describes everything. I mean, everything in a living human being, and I think that's kind of an amazing concept. But transcribe, I just want to make sure, and express, those are two words, and protein. Those are three words that have different meanings in a non-technical sense. So I just want to say transcribe is sort of just reading the code, right? Something that comes along and says, oh, here's what this is. And then express means to build the protein or or turn it on, essentially. Yeah, I, I that... think, I, I, again, I lapse into jargon. So transcribe is just copying right. the DNA into RNA. Right. And then the, the, where the code gets read is by the ribosome, which reads each uh, three-letter word, assembling a different amino acid to match each of those as it goes along the, the uh, mRNA sequence. Right. And mRNA. finally, the protein is a word. So protein is also, it's not the meat that you get in fish, you know, the stuff in fish. No, but it's it a is. serious, it's one of those words, it is, but it's one of those words that scientists use in a slightly different way than the public thinks about it. Proteins are the stuff that does the things inside the cells inside our body. So if you wanna change, I mean, if you want to make insulin, right? Insulin is a protein, so you have to have a gene it has the instructions to make insulin, and the cell has the machinery to read the instructions in the genome tra and transcribe them to turn them into a protein that makes insulin that does something in our cells. Okay, are we, I think, okay, it went by fast. See, that's what happens, you get into, this is the, the we have to start here because otherwise <laughs> yeah. it's the rest of this talk isn't gonna make any sense. You have to understand that the genes have the instructions to make things. They can either make them properly, which is health and good balance, or they can make them improperly, in which case something bad happens. It could be cancer, it could be diabetes, it could be neurodegenerative disease, it could be a lot of things. But just keep in mind that the genes make the proteins which do things, okay? And the steps are classically DNA, RNA, protein. So if you ever get confused, those are the all, that's, that's the basics, right? DNA, she's nodding, so I feel yeah. good. DNA, RNA, protein, instructions transcribe into proteins that do things. Okay, Whew. Jennifer, <laughs> <laughs> what, what part of that world do you focus on in your research? Well, um, I, my lab has always worked on RNA, so trying to understand the function of this molecule that a lot of people thought for a long time was less interesting than DNA or proteins. It's kind of the molecule in the middle. And so we, we've always had an, an interest in understanding what it does. And um, I think one of the exciting things that's happened in biology, and certainly Craig can speak to this over the last, well, really couple of decades, is that there's been kind of this uh, appreciation of the incredible diversity of RNA molecules and the importance of their function in cells and, and really for uh, human health. Right, and, and, the, and one of the keys that we're gonna get to is that you can change the DNA and that does something to the protein, but if you do something in the middle step, that also can do something to the protein. Mm -hmm. So maybe, Craig, you could talk about where your work fits in this Work. Sure, and, and just a couple of more points that I think are relevant. One, one is that you know, you're not really an organism. You're, your body is a colony, right? So you hear, you've heard about the human genome. Well, there's this microbiome that lives in you and you can't live without it. You would not be here without your, your flora and fauna that are part of you. 
Uh, it's really amazing. So information in the form of nucleic acid sequences, such as DNA and RNA, is moving around in the environment. That's what viruses are. Um, bacteria have DNA in them. They're constantly exchanging information. Um, there's benefits and there are costs. When you get infected, you can get sick. But believe it or not, there's a lot of evidence that viruses can actually help organisms sometimes. So information can move and be uh, a positive thing sometimes, but a lot of times, of course, it just makes you sick and it's bad because it'll take over, the viruses will take over the machinery inside your cells and kill you. Um, now, cells have evolved mechanisms to combat or to control uh, nucleic acids that are inside them or infecting them both. Um, and one of the ways they do that is they use uh, proteins that serve as search engines, just like you would search on the World Wide Web. They have proteins that use a short query made out of RNA, <coughs> nucleic acid sequence information, <laughs> is used to search for matching information in the genome. Because the four-letter uh, alphabet is so simple, right, if you have an RNA guide molecule, we call it, uh, or query molecule that's loaded onto one of these search engines, it will then go through the genetic sequences inside the cell and look for matching information where the, the G's, A's, T's, and C's or, uh, all line up perfectly so that when the guide sequence matches up, it'll, it'll form this helical structure with the target. And when that happens, the cell knows that it's got a perfect match. It's found a perfect match target. So, Back in 1998, Andrew Fire and I discovered um, what turned out to be an artificial way of entering queries into these search engines that exist in every one of our cells. Our, and we wouldn't be here without them. They're very, it's like imagine you had the World Wide Web, but you couldn't search it. What good would it be? Mm -hmm. Cells figured this out billions of years ago that they needed to have really rapid ways of searching through and handling information inside them. So they use these search engines to do all kinds of things. They, they, they destroy viruses with them. They uh, control their own gene expression with them. And then we discovered a way to make an artificial query that we could then give to the cell and it would enter into this searching machinery. And that's very powerful because that allows us to use the cell's own uh, searching mechanism to carry out gene regulation. And we, by, by doing this, we called it RNA interference, we could block the expression of any gene by interfering with the, um, the, the translation of the messenger RNA into protein. We could destroy the messenger or cut, kill the messenger. Um, so uh, it, it turns out that, that this has turned out to be a very useful approach for both studying uh, genetics and, and biology. And also, there's, uh, there are therapeutics that are now in clinical trials in humans. So it's an exciting field. But the, but the interesting thing is, this is not rewriting genes. Right. That's we're a, talking that, about the, the RNA level. We're intervening after the DNA has been copied into RNA. Right. So, so remember, you can change the code and change what the protein does, or you can do some to that middle guy and have that middle guy do something that changes what the protein does or how it works or whether it sw switches on. This is a funny concept too because if you think about it, all the cells in our body have all the, well, oh my, let's leave lots of germ cells. <laughs> all the cells in our body have all the instructions for all the things that we need to stay alive, but the cells in your liver don't have, aren't using the same proteins as the cells in your brain or the cells in your skin. So some of those genes have to be turned on or expressed while others are not. And so if you suddenly find that there's something in the liver that's turning on that shouldn't be, or that you want to turn off this thing to see what it does to make the liver function properly, well, you come along with Craig's probe and you send it into the cell and it goes and turns that gene off, and then you say, oh, I wonder what that did, and you look and see. And that's sort of how the research works, if I've got it right. Mm -hmm. But Jennifer, you're actually doing something a little different than that, because your lab has come on to this, well, maybe, actually, it's a version of that. It's not quite that. Yeah, I guess you could call it a version of that. I mean, I think one of the interesting things when 
um, when Andy Fire and Craig Mello made this discovery about RNA interference, one of the curiosities, I guess, at the time was that, um, that bacteria, which is, is a very, as you know, many, many different types of bacteria on the planet, um, none of them seemed to do this. And people could not find the molecular machinery for RNA interference in those types of cells. And so the question that we had was, um, you know, we were sort of interested in, in how these, these RNA molecules do this, this searching, and we were studying that. Um, and then um, a, in, in, in around 2005, there were uh, a few sort of obscure um, observations about about bacterial systems that looked like they might be aligned or similar at least to RNA interference. There was no experimental data for this at the time. It was basic, based on looking at the genomes of bacteria and realizing that uh, many bacteria have a way of stealing little pieces of DNA from viruses that they get infected with. They, they um, they integrate or they incorporate those pieces of DNA into their genomic or genetic material, and then they make an RNA copy of that information. And just like Craig described, they use those pieces of, of, of information in the form of RNA to search the cell for matching sequences that might come from a virus. And if they find a match, then they have proteins that can um, engage with that at that point, that piece of, of DNA that has been um, identified as foreign and, um, and lead to its destruction. And so that, um, that was a, a hypothesis and, and we started investigating it thinking that it would be very interesting to just, you know, we were just curious, basically wanted to understand, you know, if bacteria really uh, were capable of that sort of um, activity and you know you can if you think about it it's really like an acquired immune system right you acquire information from your your invader and then you use that in the form of RNA to protect the cell so that was the idea that we set out to test and so in the course of doing that that research um, and of course other labs started to investigate this as well and over the next few years it emerged that in fact this is exactly what happens in, in bacteria. They have this ability to acquire uh, sequence information and then use it in the form of RNA. So a very interesting parallel, I would say, to RNAi. And uh, but I'm a you know I'm a biochemist and a, a structural biologist, so I'm very interested in the molecules that do this. How do they work? And that's the question that we really wanted to address. That led to. <laughs> Um, a technology that is now um, really taking off for, for genome engineering. So explain, okay, so explain why, so people, this is, an, people have been manipulating genes and doing things with genes and rewriting genes and there's genetically modified organisms and there's all this stuff, but yet what you've done, this new idea, this thing, it's called CRISPR, which again, we won't tell you the acronym because we'll both, <laughs> somebody will get it wrong and then somebody else will laugh and it'll come <laughs> But um, CRISPR allows you to do something that's different, even though it's doing some of the same things. So what's different? Well, I guess I would say what's different is that, I guess the way, the way that I think about it is it's like a molecular scalpel. It's a very precise tool that can be used to identify a particular place in a genome. And you think about you know, the vastness of the human genome, for example, and imagine being able, imagine knowing that there is a single uh, change in the four-letter sequence of the genetic code in a human cell that is giving rise to a defective protein. Um, I could, you know, many examples of this. Cystic fibrosis is an example. Um, you know, sickle cell anemia is another example. Lots of genetic diseases that are caused by a known mutation or change in the DNA that creates a, 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 a bad or ineffective protein. And so what if you had a precision tool like a scalpel to go in and actually make the change, correct that exact site in the DNA and not affect anything else in the DNA? Very, very powerful. And that's basically what this uh, CRISPR technology enables, is that kind of precision change to the DNA. 
I, I, can I jump yeah, in sure, for a minute? Please. Yeah. I mean, Jennifer's uh, lab has uh, been working again on the structures of these proteins that do this. So in, in RNA interference, the search engine searches through the messages that are out in the cytoplasm uh, and sometimes in the nucleus as well, but it's basically searching single-stranded sequences for matching information. But this enzyme, this bacterial enzyme, and, and this is really basic science, because when Jennifer and others started working on this, there was no uh, uh, glimmer, really, that this would actually be useful in humans uh, or in human cells. But basically what this enzyme does is it searches the same, sort of the same way in a similar way for perfect base pairing interactions, but it opens up the DNA, it unwinds the DNA, and it searches both strands of the whole genome. Billions of nucleotides of information, it searches through all that information somehow, uh, you know, scanning the whole genome for a match. When it finds a precise match, it actually allows this base pairing interaction that's highly specific, and then it cuts not only the strand that's base paired to, but the other strand as well. It has two enzymes. It's so beautiful, and the structures that Jennifer's lab has made are just mind-blowing, uh, showing how this enzyme can engage the DNA and make these very precise cuts. So it is just like, like Jennifer said, like a scalpel that you can direct towards any part of the genome to make these extremely precise but that's, cuts. But that's a very important point. So, so something that to appreciate about this that, that helps you understand, it's, I think, the power of this technology, is that we figured out how to program this, okay? So it's programmable. So you take the ability to program the scalpel and you combine that with the genetic information that we have for the human genome, we know the sequence of uh, many human genomes now, but other, other genomes from other organisms as well. And so you have that information, and you can now program this CRISPR uh, tool, with a, it's a protein called Cas9, to actually recognize a site that you know is defective in the genome to make a break in the DNA. And then after that occurs, the cell can repair that break by incorporating new genetic information at the site. And there are various ways to control how that repair happens. And so you put all of those uh, technologies and, and, and information together, and it creates an incredible opportunity in biology. And this is what we're seeing right now. It's just an incredible explosion of research that's using genomic information from humans, but also from other kinds of organisms, combined with uh, the technology to now make changes, very precise changes in that information, and do it quickly, and also, very importantly, do it simply, right? So it might, maybe it sounds complicated, but it turns out that for, for anybody that has a basic knowledge of molecular biology, um, this can be done easily and quickly and effectively. So we've had, we've had high school students come to the lab, and within a few weeks of training, they're doing this type of precision genome editing. And I was just thinking one final analogy that may help a little bit in kind of getting your head around this is it's a little bit like first we had the book or like think of it as a word processor. First we could write all these words down and then we had this function that was allow you to find so you could search for words and then the next step was search and replace or search and so you get that extra step of not only finding things and maybe taking them out, but now you can find them, take them out, or put something new in, in a very powerful way. Um, and so as long as you know the book, and you know the instructions to use the word processor, you're good to go, sort of. Now, Craig, you started out by talking about um, diseases, human diseases, that, that might be, um, and that there are already therapeutics that are based on your, the RNA interference technique. And when we first were kicking around ideas for how to name this session, we were thinking about, okay, the end of genetic diseases. And that made you uncomfortable. So I want to talk about why that is. I mean, where are we realistically mm -hmm. in terms of applying these tools into something that people say, oh, well, that's great. I'm glad you discovered that. You know, <laughs> My aunt is alive because of it. That's a great question, Joe. And I, I, uh, to, to answer it, I, I'll just sort of go back to the last night we had a discussion uh, at dinner 
um, about you know, what are the major gaps in knowledge um, that we face. And uh, I made the analogy of my uh, for old friend uh, Neil Shubin, who went up to uh, Canada and uh, high Canadian Arctic and found this amazing fossil of a fish from 350 million some years ago that had these vestigial forelimbs. And when he came back and everybody was celebrating, his colleagues congratulated him for, con for creating two new gaps in the fossil record. <laughs> 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 um, but in genetics, that's exactly what's happened uh, with genome sequencing. So when you sequence a genome like the human genome, you it create a great deal of new knowledge, right? But as with all science, all new knowledge actually creates more questions than answers. And so with human genetics, now we have very personal gaps in knowledge because we as individuals may know that we have a genetic, um, you know, we have a, an, a lesion or a polymorphism in a gene that may be linked to a disease, something terrible like Alzheimer's or a neurodegenerative disease like Huntington's disease. Um, and yet, Knowing what's wrong with your DNA doesn't mean that we have a therapy, doesn't mean that we can fix it. Um, and increasingly now, you're, when you go to get a health checkup in the hospital, or if you unfortunately get cancer or someone in your family does, then all of a sudden you have this additional burden of new information, right? Your dad might have cancer, and then you start to wonder, well, if he has the gene, do I have the gene that, that predisposed him to that cancer? My dad had prostate cancer, so right now there's no genetic test for that. But um, you know, these are the kinds of burdens and gaps in our knowledge that are affecting all of us now when it comes to healthcare. So genetic, genetics in humans is now driving laboratory science because we can take a genetic lesion that's known to be linked to disease in a human, and using CRISPR, we can model that disease now in an organism where we can study it much more effectively, a fruit fly or a worm or a mouse. We can now incorporate exactly the same lesion that causes a disease in a human and then study it in an animal. And that's, that's very powerful. So probably more important than actually developing a therapy based on fixing the human disorder, we can now study in an animal setting where we might be able to find a small molecule or some other biological approach, by, you know, an antibody or something that would, would have a therapeutic effect for that, that patient. So the era of <clears throat> genetics and human genetics is absolutely upon us. It's, it's, you know, there are potentials for applying this technology to directly correct human genetic disorders in human cells. Um, so there's that, but there's also this reverse flow where we used to model or try to understand biology in a model organism and then try to extrapolate from the human, increasingly we're taking information from the human, genetic information from the human, and now trying to model that in organisms. And so there's a huge need for additional research because there are thousands of human disease-related genes now, and uh, it's a really exciting time right now in, in genetics. Just to remind people, the, the hashtag global health, if you have a question that you want me to see on this iPad or if you're out in uh, the World Wide Web land and you want to ask questions, please do. Um, but that's it brings me to a question, Jennifer. Uh, 30 years ago, probably, just about, uh, when we had the gene that causes cystic fibrosis, we knew what it looked like and we knew some of the places where it went wrong and could cause disease. Cause that's another problem with genetics. They gave names for genes that are necessary and make people think they're bad. The cystic fibrosis gene is a gene we all have to have for our cells to work properly. It's only when that gene is incorrect that we get the disease. Bad genetics. If they had asked me, I would have stopped them from using that terminology <laughs> a long time ago. Anyway, they do. It doesn't matter. But that was in a day, 30 years ago, when we had gene therapy. Oh, we know the sequence of the gene. We can make a proper copy and scoot it back in 30 years ago. And there is no gene therapy. I mean, there's the beginnings of gene therapy in some places. I'm not, I'm not saying. What's different? Why is CRISPR, are we, we going to say 30 years ago, we thought, well, CRISPR was going to give us the answer of how to fix these genes, but now we don't. I mean, what's different, do you think? I think 30 years ago, you know, to do an experiment like you're describing, would uh, require using, for example, a virus to deliver 
um, a normal copy of the gene. And the viral, uh, the way that the virus works is to go, you know, it, it gets into a cell using a sort of an, an infection pathway. And, um, and then depending on the type of virus, uh, either it integrates into the genome, but it integrates where it wants to integrate, not where you want it to go. Um, or it stays inside the cell but doesn't actually um, replicate or get, you know, copied into the genome of the cell. So um, yes, you could introduce the, the normal copy of the gene using those sorts of approaches, but, um, you know, it was very difficult to control the way that gene would then be expressed or, you know, would be used to produce the correct copy of the protein in those cells. I think the difference now is that with a precision tool, the CRISPR system allows scientists to, if you know, and we do in this case, where that gene is located and you know the sequence of the gene and you actually know the sequence of the mutation in the gene, you can design this system to go in, recognize it, cut it out, and then allow the cell to repair it with a normal copy of the gene. And now you have in principle, at least, you have now a corrected uh, genomic sequence that can allow the cell to function normally. So Craig, do you think um, CRISPR or that technology is going to accelerate the path to therapies? It's certainly going to accelerate knowledge about how cells work and how and allow scientists to do interesting experiments. But and what do you think about the therapeutic potential? I think there's a great therapeutic potential uh, for, especially for cells that can be taken from patients and uh, manipulated in the laboratory. So if you can take a stem cell population from a patient that has a genetic disorder and repair uh, the, the genetic lesion in the laboratory where it's safe and you can make sure that you've affected the change you want and made no others, then you can reintroduce those cells in a, in a setting where uh, they'll then provide that function now uh, to, to the person. What, where it's harder to do is to take someone, let's say, who has a muscular dystrophy or Down syndrome or something like that and actually try to affect a change globally throughout the body of the individual or throughout all the muscles. Or in uh, a tissue type, or in right? Or the brain, yeah. 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 So there it's very difficult. Again, the delivery problem <laughs> is the real problem. And another thing that, you know, I think one reason everyone has to know about CRISPR is you can rewrite the human germline with CRISPR very mm -hmm. tell easily. Them what the, tell them what the germline germ is. Germline, that's the sperm and the egg lineage. So uh, it used to be, you know, really hard to do that kind of manipulation on an animal like us, but now people have done uh, CRISPR on other primates already, on uh, lots of different types of livestock, uh, you know, cows, pigs, uh, people are doing this. And it, there, it's really a powerful tool because breeders, when they used to breed animals together, would have to cross them together and then segregate all the traits away. But now with CRISPR, you can move one trait at a time uh, very rapidly. Or multiple one, traits at a or time. Or multiple traits at yeah. a time. Yeah, it's it's really a powerful tool for uh, changing the genomes of organisms uh, permanently by affecting what's called the germline. Um, and so that's, that's something that everybody really needs to sort of understand because, first of all, you know, there are ethical implications there, a lot of them. Um, and it's something that's, you know, much more likely to happen now that it's so easy to do. So it's important that people be aware that that is something that's uh, Before we leave that, Jennifer, can you, can you sort of sketch out, I know you've been thinking about this, what are some of the ethical implications of modifying the sperm or egg of an organism? Well, I think Craig, you know, sort of sketched, you know, the, the fact that this is now something that it's a technology that's easy to employ to do this. Um, the challenge is that, um, that uh, you know, yes, we have genomic information, um, but we don't understand, or at least I don't understand, all of that information. We don't know um, what will really happen if you make a change at one place in the genome. Does it really only affect that one um, you know, protein that gets encoded there if it's, a, if it's a change that's made in a gene, or are there other effects that we can't predict later on, right, that might happen? So I think that that's a, a really important challenge. And then I think that, you know, the question always comes up, you know, if you, 
if you um, if if this type of thing were to happen with humans, um, you know, where 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 do you do you draw a line, or and if you do, where do you draw a line? I mean, if it's, it's okay to correct the mutation that causes cystic fibrosis, but is it okay for someone to say, well, I'd like my child to have blue eyes and not brown, right? And you can go on from there. So I think that you know, it's just a, it's a very important uh, conversation that needs to happen. And one of the things that I would like to do, and we, we have a, a new initiative at, at UC Berkeley and UC San Francisco called the Innovative Genomics Initiative. And one of our goals is to educate people about this technology and also to uh, to really try to, um, you know, foster the conversation about bioethics that comes up around this. We do have a question from the uh, internet or from uh, the Twitterverse. Uh, this is from someone who says he's in Indonesia, or I think it's he. How can we cure cancer with genetic engineering? Is it a possibility to cure cancer, Craig? Well, you know, th there are lots of different therapies for cancer that are extremely successful. You know, the war on cancer, you know, the scientists sort of uh, always sort of overpromise, I guess, or get misinterpreted, uh, enthusiasm gets misinterpreted. You know, like the title that was proposed for this session, The End of Genetic Disease, um, it's really um, just the beginning of understanding <coughs> genetic disease, not even close to the end. But uh, there are therapies for cancer now that are very effective, and there will be more therapies. Some of them probably will employ uh, CRISPR and genome editing. There's a, a new type of therapy for cancer called immunotherapy, which uh, I think is absolutely beautiful, where a patient's uh, own immune system is essentially uh, used or, or adapted so that it will attack the cancer. And then you can reinfuse the the cells, modify the cells so that they'll recognize the cancer cells and they'll go and then kill the cancer cells. So your immune system that normally fights and destroys infected cells can be educated so that it will attack cancer cells specifically. And there's an opportunity to use CRISPR to help uh, make the, that type of attack even more precise so that you can try to engineer the immune system to do this. And some of the, th the clinical trials uh, of this new therapy are, look very promising where individuals, for example, with inoperable brain tumors are showing uh, what looks like complete remission uh, with the, without need, need of a surgery. You know, so the cells go into the brain, find the tumors and destroy them. So uh, yeah, there's some really exciting applications in that area. Um, I, I, you know, that's the one that comes to mind, but I'm not yeah. sure that you'd really be able to use this to engineer the cancer in order to kill itself, and it's probably not going to work because evolution is working against you there. Right, but there's an interesting point also to make here, and that's the difference between a genetic disease in the sense that it's inherited and a genetic disease in the sense that something's gone wrong with the genetic machinery inside of a cell, and that's really what's happening a lot of the times in cancer. It's not that necessarily that you inherited something bad that's going to cause cancer, it could be something that changes over the course of a lifetime in the way the genes are functioning inside of a cell that can cause the cancer. Is that, do I have that right? Yeah, you do, yeah. And so, uh, does CRISPR, I mean, once you make a change with CRISPR, like if you took out um, cells from me, these maybe bone marrow stem cells that Craig was talking about, like they do bone marrow transplants now, and you made some change in those, would that change persist if you put them back in me, and they would they keep having that over and over again as they populated in my yes, body? Yes, if they're if they are what what are called stem cells, you know, cells that can proliferate over mm -hmm. many generations in the body, right? right? One example of a therapy like that is the ser therapy to create uh, for people with HIV to create resistance mm -hmm. to, to HIV by mutating the CCR5 receptor on the cells that the HIV needs to get into the cell. So if you take a patient that's already infected, you get bone marrow cells from the patient that are not infect, infected cells, make that correction, put those cells back, then those cells will not be able to get infected. So the, the patient will then, those cells are now under positive selective pressure mm -hmm. because the other cells are being destroyed by the virus and they take up residence, populate the immune system of that individual, and then 
uh, hopefully you've affected a, a therapy. So we are already know that people who have that mutation are resistant to HIV. Mm -hmm. So um, those are, there's, there are clinical trials for, for doing that using another version of a genome editing tool. <clears throat> Jennifer, you alluded to this earlier, but I, I want to uh, sort of hammer home this point that when you were uh, doing your research over the last couple of decades, you weren't sitting in your lab thinking, okay, how can I cure human diseases? Um, it was sort of like, oh, that would be a nice consequence, but, but you were asking a very, very kind of basic question about how cell machinery works. What's the connection there? I mean, how, how do scientists both work on something basic but have their minds open to something that might have a, a therapeutic potential? Well, I think a lot of uh, the important technologies that have come out for um, manipulating DNA in particular, but other things as well, have really come from this sort of curiosity-driven research by scientists who are, you know, not, not going after a, a new technology in particular, but are just uh, investigating how, how things work. And in the course of doing so, they stumble across something or realize that something can be harnessed for a, uh, as a technology. And that's, you know, you, there are many uh, interesting examples of this. Actually, a lot of them have come from bacteria, you know. So uh, something called the polymerase chain reaction, which is a way that uh, we can amplify or make many, many copies of just a particular segment of DNA. That's something that came uh, from the bacterial world and, again, was from curiosity-driven research, not, not necessarily uh, to create a technology. And, um, you know, the something called green fluorescent protein, which is used for uh, labeling cells, another uh, idea that came from just under, you know, wanting to understand, you know, how do certain types of organisms have, uh, are able to turn their bodies green, from fluorescent jellyfish. green, from jellyfish, <laughs> right? So, you know, just very, very interesting. So I think, I think um, to me, this really underscores the value of doing that kind of research. And I mean, Craig... Also, his laboratory also does research that uh, I would say is of a very fundamental nature, trying to understand the basics of biology. And again, you know, his research came across uh, something where you know, they realized in the course of doing their experiments that this could actually be a really interesting, really exciting uh, technology. Yeah, you know, the, the basic science really is so important and so powerful in uh, you know, when you're trying to understand something extremely fundamental about how cells work, we, and we still have a lot that we don't understand, but the thing that people don't realize is that the genetic code is the same in bacteria and humans. The same four letters, the same three-letter words, um, and the same amino acids assembling the protein. So you can learn a huge amount. In fact, the genetic code was deciphered using bacteria and bacteria phage, bacteria viruses, to study the, the human, you know, to figure out the genetic code. And later on, we realized that, the, that it's the same in humans. So there are really, really fundamental questions that we need to answer. And like Jennifer's field of, of protein structure, one of the huge unknowns right now is how, can, from a primary sequence of, of amino acids, could you or how can you predict how a protein will fold? Because there's all kinds of, even though there's only 20 different amino acids, 20 different words, if you will, they have really, uh, really um, intricate chemistry associated with each of them, and they assemble in three dimensions. So you get these emergent properties when proteins fold, and we don't understand that. Even the fastest computers we have are really lousy at predicting structure, so you have to actually determine the structure of these proteins. You can't just read the sequence and say, oh, I know what that protein would look like. Yeah. So. And I think one of the best ways to think about the importance of basic research is if you think about the work that was being done in the 1950s on trying to understand what to do about polio, there were a lot of people who were designing better iron lungs because that was a really concrete thing you could do to help polio victims survive longer. But the real breakthrough of polio came from a basic understanding of the virus that caused polio. And suddenly, instead of building better iron lungs, we were designing a vaccine that prevented polio in the first place. So you sometimes say, well, what's the connection between basic research and where does it get us? And the answer is, it takes us, uh, it's almost this quantum step forward um, that, you know, applied research sometimes only gets you small baby steps. Anyway, just saying. Um, we have time for one quick question. It's a big question, but I wanted to take it. Um, it's from the internet, and it says, 
who owns this new genetic tool? <laughs> and uh, I don't know whether you want to take that, Craig, We're and the spare lawyers. CRISPR. Well, but maybe you can just sketch out a little bit about the fact that there is some issue about that. Yeah, um, and it's certainly it's not something to tackle in a, in a couple of minutes. But um, uh, Jennifer and, and her co-workers uh, filed some of the original uh, intellectual property around uh, how to um, essentially design guide RNA molecules that will enter into this search machinery, uh, which I think is a really fundamental piece of intellectual property. But there's a lot of intellectual property that is coming along as people figure out other ways and better ways maybe of, of designing uh, guide RNAs and to modify the enzyme itself. It's really, I mean, that's another thing, you know, this investment in basic science does lead to in big economic impacts. Um, RNA interference is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, you can order a guide RNA for doing an RNA eye experiment and have it delivered here by FedEx tomorrow if you want it. Um, I don't know if they have same day delivery, but, but <laughs> seriously, you can knock out any gene in the human genome uh, with a guide RNA from from the, you know, order it off the web. So, you know, these, these, there's a lot of intellectual property. There's, uh, it's still being sorted out um, and uh, there'll be a lot more, but that's good for the economy because it's, it start, leads to startups. Um, Jennifer and I are both involved in different startup companies that are, that are commercializing this technology. All right, well, I'm afraid we're gonna have to leave it there. There will be an opportunity to comment on this session if you enjoyed it on the way out. And so we'll end simply by asking you all to uh, give our speakers a round of applause.